This episode is brought to you by Audible. For a 30-day free trial and one free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. Happy New Year, everybody. For this first episode of the new year, we decided to do something a little bit different. So a couple months ago, we were asked to answer some questions for a different show that was doing a segment about polyamory and non-monogamy. And as we were recording it, we thought, hey, this is a lot of great stuff that kind of covers both the basics as well as where we've all come today from where we started in polyamory, as well as some sort of personal stories and some of our experiences. So we decided to cut together our own version of that content where we're asking ourselves the questions and then answering them and to put them out as a show for you who want to be able to hear the whole thing. And so with that, let's get to the show. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. Hi, I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker, and we are the hosts of the Multi-Emory Podcast. We offer new ideas and advice about multiple forms of love, from conscious monogamy to ethical polyamory and radical relationship anarchy. Today, we want to talk to you about polyamory and why many people find it to be a better way for them to cultivate happy and healthy relationships. So to start off, what is polyamory? That's a great question. The million dollar question. Um, so there's been a lot of debate about the quote unquote official definition of polyamory, but here's mine. Polyamory is the practice of maintaining multiple romantic relationships at the same time with the full knowledge and consent of everyone involved. So I include that part to set it aside from um, non-consensual, non-ethical, non-monogamy, which is cheating. Um, in polyamory, all of my partners know about each other, frequently have met each other, and everything is honest and on the table. And it's not polygamy, which a lot of people ask like, oh, so it's that Mormon thing? And it's definitely not that. Um, polygamy actually refers to a marriage and then multiple potentially like wives or husbands um, generally, in that sense, it's multiple wives, but that is not what this is. Often people are not married at all. They just are having multiple romantic relationships with the knowledge of every single person involved. Right. And that is knowledge beforehand, not just like, oh, hey, by the way, I'm <laughs> dating got, a bunch of people. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> that this is something that everyone knows about before you go and start having those other relationships. Exactly. Okay, so this is kind of related to what we're already talking about, but the next question here is, how does polyamory differ from monogamy? Yeah, I mean, God, there's a lot of ways. <laughs> but mostly, it, it, the, the main one that probably most people are going to see is that you're not just with one single human being. You're not just in a couple. You may have multiple couple relationships, or it may take even different ways in different forms like a triad which is three people in a relationship all together or a v where one person is the hinge and then two people are in a relationship with that person but not with each other but not with each other there's a ton of different different ways that polyamory can take shape yeah people definitely have all kinds of configurations of how they choose to build their multi-partner relationships um i'm gonna get a little more philosoph philosophical here with my response um for me the main difference between polyamory and monogamy is that in polyamory you are finding a sense of commitment in your romantic relationships that is not based just on sexual exclusivity alone mm. um that's kind of the linchpin for me. And, and I know a lot of people kind of get weirded out. They're like, what? Commitment? But you 
you're not monogamous. How can you be committed? And for me, commitment is very much related to me being the best possible partner I can be to in a relationship and, you know, being dedicated to a partner or multiple partners, um, you know, knowing that just because something gets difficult in a relationship, I'm not going to head for the hills. Um, so that's my sense for commitment is based on that. It's not just you're the only person that I'm sleeping with. Um, and I don't mean I don't say that to be really reductive toward monogamy, but that's definitely kind of one of the biggest uh, things that I think people notice. And the answer that I like to give to this question is not it's not as different from monogamy as you might think mm. that actually relationships are still just relationships. The only part that's different is the fact that you're not agreeing that you're the only person I can love and the only person I can have sex with or be physical with that. That's the only piece that's different. But other than that, it still comes down to the same important parts, which are your communication, how much you care about each other, how compatible you are, how respectful you are of each other, all of those things that make a good monogamous relationship are still there. So I actually think it's a lot less different than some people think. I will say um, it cultivates a sense of autonomy that a lot of monogamous relationships may not have. Um, often when you talk to a monogamous person, they'll say like, well, we love this thing. Or we are, you know, trying to have a baby or something, and it becomes all about the couple. Uh, whereas people in polyamory can maybe sort of distance themselves from just being a part of a unit and are their own person, and they can decide and kind of create relationships outside of just that initial beginning unit. Yeah, also to go with that, it's the idea that. I'm with you, not because we got into a relationship and now I'm not allowed to be with anyone else, but I'm with you because I love you and because I'm attracted to you and because I like spending time with you, that I think it actually adds a lot of power and intimacy to your existing relationships to know you're in them, that every day you're in them because you want to be in them and not just because, well, I'm stuck and this is the only way that we can do relationships, so I guess I have to stay in this. Yeah, I know that was something that always used to get to me in my monogamous relationships was this constant fear of like, oh, maybe my partner's not as excited by me anymore or not as attracted to me anymore, not as interested in me anymore. And they're only sticking around because we decided years ago that they're going to stick around and that we're going to be monogamous and that he's really, he really doesn't want to be with me. He just feels obligated. And now in non-monogamous relationships, there is kind of more of that sense of like, no, this person is with me. They could be with whoever they wanted to because they're allowed, you know, they could sleep with whoever they want to. They could go on a date with whoever they want to, but they are still choosing to be in a relationship with me, even with all of that going on. Our next question is, how long have you been polyamorous? Goodness. Well, I, yeah. Th I think I'm, I'm almost coming up on 10 years. Wow. That yeah, I'm almost, I think I'm at eight or nine years of, and that's, I mean, I'm, I'm counting that based on when I first started actively being in non-monogamous relationships. As far as how long have I felt polyamorous um, or felt capable of being in love with more than one person, that probably goes way, way back. Yeah, for me, um, I first, you know, first started exploring ethical non-monogamy, which is sort of a bigger term that polyamory is part of. I originally started exploring that about 12 years ago when I started to rethink some things around like jealousy and possessiveness about my partners. But it wasn't until more recently, about five years ago, I'd say when Emily and I opened our relationship that had been monogamous before that. And in researching about that and finding stuff to read, came across this term polyamory and started learning more about that. Yeah, I w had never heard of it before at all. I knew that relatives of mine were actually polyamorous, and I thought that was really weird, and I didn't really know what it meant. And then Jace and I opened up a relationship, and I um, read The Ethical Slut, and um, Jace read Sex at Dawn, which are both two really big uh, kind of books in the polyamorous community. And from there, yeah, I've been practicing it 
kind of mostly on, but some on and off, and kind of taking different shapes and different forms of what polyamory and non-monogamy can mean over the last five years of my life. So to go off of that, can you describe the first time you were introduced to polyamory? The first time I was introduced to polyamory, I guess, yeah, Jace, you and I were realizing like we wanted our relationship to take a different shape. We didn't know exactly what that meant, um, but you had read the book Stranger in a Strange Land many years prior to that and talked about how profound that was for you and that you had been thinking about different ways in which to love, ways that weren't so possessive and so much about, you know, only loving one person or only sleeping with one person for the rest of your life and what that exactly meant for you. And it was really difficult for me at first, um, but there was something always that I kind of got about it that I wanted to explore further. And so finally we did start to take that plunge and Dedeker entered our lives later on. And yeah, it's been interesting and amazing ever since. For me, I mean, the first, I guess, to again, distinguish between when I was formally introduced to the concept of polyamory versus when I first felt capable of it, um, they're kind of two different points in my history. Um, when I was quite young, when I was first entering high school and when I was first exploring uh, you know, what adult relationships could be like, um, the first time that I ever, you know, I was in a monogamous relationship and then realized that I was still attracted to other people and even was get developing crushes on other people. And at that point in my life, like nothing had prepared me for that because literally every single message that I'd gotten from going to church and from Disney movies was that if you're actually in love with someone, then you don't see anybody else and you don't want to be with anybody else and you're not attracted to anybody else. And so for pretty much my entire, you know, all of my teenage years, I thought that there was something wrong with me. The fact that I was attracted to other people, even if I was happy in a relationship, or the fact that I would start falling in love with other people, even when I was happy in a relationship, like, I took that as a sign that, oh, something's wrong with me, like, I'm broken, or I'm messed up in some way, or I'm incapable of having a relationship, um, and it wasn't until many, 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 many years later um, that that narrative about myself started to change, um, and uh yeah, I, I think that um, I was in a relationship in my early 20s and um, I had had these thoughts of like wondering what an open relationship might be like. And I started Googling open relationships because I had no idea what that was even about. And that's how I kind of came across this term polyamory. And that was the first time that I got exposed to people who identified as polyamorous who were happy and loved each other and were in these viable, like long-term stable relationships. And it, it really just blew my mind. I had no idea that people were living this way and that they were happy and that they were committed to each other, that it wasn't just a sex thing, that it wasn't just a casual relationship thing, that people were doing this. And after that point, I just got really voracious in consuming all the books and all the media and all the blogs and everything that I could possibly uh, consume to educate myself about it um you know so that was the beginning of my journey and and since then you know um my relationships have taken many different forms and many different shapes and i've continued to learn what it is that i like and what it is that i don't like and with each relationship i've definitely gotten closer to understanding like what is it that makes me happy but ultimately at the end of the day it's always been some form of non-monogamy or polyamory there hasn't yet been a point where i have thought like well, this sucks. I'm going to go back to monogamy. Mm -hmm. um, for me, you know, learning about polyamory formally was definitely a huge turning point in my life where nothing could go back to the way that it was before. Yeah. And for me, it was, you know, I had, as I said before, I had experienced some, uh, you know, consensual non monogamy before, which essentially just meant, you know, either giving each other permission to go sleep with somebody else occasionally, or, you know, it was kind of only sex things, or maybe having a threesome once or twice, but still in a monogamous relationship. And that for me was kind of this intro to seeing like, hey, this doesn't make me love this partner any less. It doesn't make me less attracted to them. 
Uh, and that relationship ultimately didn't work out for other reasons. But many years later, I was actually talking to a female friend of mine who I had dated before, and then we had just become friends. And I said to her, you know, what I wish was possible was to have, to be able to have multiple emotional relationships with people and to not, you know, have to have there be this inherent jealousy with them or that because I liked someone else meant I liked one of them less. And I basically described parts of what polyamory is even without knowing it. So then years later in my relationship with Emily, when we, you know, we said, well, let's try an open relationship because that's all we'd really heard of. And then we started learning about polyamory and seeing, oh, wow, not only is this actually a thing it's possible to do, but there are people who are doing it and people who've spent a lot of time really thinking about and looking at how to do this well, that it's not just like, oh, people who want to be polyamorous, it's just easy for them all the time, but there actually are you know, things to learn, just like there are things to learn about how to have better monogamous relationships or better friendships or relationships of any kind. So what's our next question here? Our next question is, what do you most like about being poly? I mean, there's so many things to like, but hey, I'll touch back on one of the things that I said before, which is that sense of autonomy. I felt often in my monogamous relationships, like I kind of got lost in them that I was sort of compartmentalizing myself and like pushing myself in this box of what I believed my partner wanted me to be. Not necessarily what they did want me to be, but just what I thought they wanted me to be. And that that sort of stunted my growth as a human being over time. And being polyamorous allowed me to have all of these great connections with so many different types of people and allowed like my growth as a human being to continue in a way that I'd never had felt before with anyone or with any type of relationship structure. And that was really profound for me at the time and continues in various forms and ways to be profound for me in my life. Um, and definitely as I've moved like currently more into um, back into like a monogamish or sort of open, sort of thinking about being open, but not necessarily like actively seeking out partners, I've still been able to maintain some of those lessons when I was like very actively polyamorous in my current dating life. I think my favorite part about it is the idea that every relationship gets to be shaped individually by the people who are in it. That it's not just, oh, we're in a relationship, so that means we have to be moving toward this next step, which is being exclusive, and then it has to go to the next step of becoming boyfriend and girlfriend, or moving in, or getting married, and then having kids, and that there's kind of this sense of, if you're not getting to the next step, then you need to leave and go find someone else, because if you found the right one, if you found your life's purpose, you're going to want to do all these steps, and that's often what I did and, you know, went through various monogamous relationships. But for me in polyamory, I like that every relationship can look different, can have different parts to it and is something that the two of us in that relationship are consciously and intentionally talking about and making a relationship that's how we want it to be and that can change in the ways that we want it to change rather than thinking it has to do these certain steps in order to be valid. I think, I mean, there's so many pieces to it for me, but I know something that I often come back to is having a sense of tribe a little bit. And what I mean by that is some of my happiest memories are, you know, gatherings or parties that I've been to where, you know, I have a partner at that party who also has his other partner at that party. And she also has her other partner who's come to the party. And then I have another partner and then he's also brought his other partner. And also maybe I have an ex partner of mine who came, but we're still friends. But then he brought his new partner. And basically this idea that we're all connected in this way and um, we're all able to just be kind to each other and to love each other and to, I don't know, 
don't know, really know what I'm trying to say. It's it's just this sense of like that. I think it, it builds off of what Jace was saying that like these relationships are built the way that they're that they're organically meant to be built, and it's kind of outside of what the status quo is and outside of what what social expectations are. And so that means that we can make them to be whatever we want them to be. So that means as in, I can get along with my ex's new partner, or I can become best friends with my partner's other partner that we don't have to fall into the sense of like, oh, obviously the other woman that your partner's dating, like you must hate each other's guts, you know, that it doesn't have to be that, that actually, no, we can proactively choose for these relationships to be good and to be uplifting and to be fortifying to our lives as human beings. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I end up coming back to as like the best parts or like the, the things that make me the happiest about being polyamorous. I think it's related too to what Emily was saying about maintaining your autonomy and not getting lost in a relationship. Because I think most people out there have had the experience of having a really good friend who gets into a romantic relationship and then basically just disappears from your life, at least for a while, because they sort of get like sucked into that relationship where it's the only thing they ever want to do or think about or any of that. And that how you were describing that situation where you can have multiple partners as well as their other partners and exes who are friends and also just friends, that there is kind of this sense of by being in a relationship, I'm not closing myself off from everyone else I know, but instead, you know, I'm still open to the rest of my connections, whether they're romantic or not. It takes away that sense of competition that I think in America, especially, we have so ingrained within us that, you know, we have to be the best, that you have to have a best friend or you have to have the one that you're always with and always doing everything with. And instead, like going back to that sense of tribalism that we are all in this together in this like great big challenging thing called life. And it's easier to do when you have multiple people doing it with you. And not so freaking awful and hard because there's only one other person with me at all times. And, you know, sometimes we hate each other and sometimes we get angry at each other (laughs) and said, you know, you're moving forward together. And that brings us to our next big one, which is what are some misconceptions of polyamory? There are so many. Um, (laughs) One that I encounter a lot is that polyamory is just something that you do while you're young or if you don't want to have any serious relationships or if you don't want to get married or if you don't want to have kids, then polyamory is for you. Um, And that's patently untrue for a number of reasons. Um, First of all, like a lot of people uh, who are polyamorous are also raising kids or are getting married, um, are building homes and building nests where maybe they are raising their children with multiple parents or maybe they're co-parenting with one person but then they have another partner who lives outside of the home that's still involved in the child's life um so definitely you know whether you want your relationships to be casual or super super serious um people still make polyamory work um i know for myself that that's actually again that's that's one of my favorite parts about it is being able to have more of the good stuff that a really long-term, deeply intimate, emotionally connected relationship brings. Um, that I I enjoy that, you know, and that for me, it's not just about like me kind of waiting around until I f- actually find the one or waiting around until I find the one person I want to settle down with. Like, no, like I found my ones. There are multiple ones and that's <laughs> why I'm keeping them in my life. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think... That's, that's a really common one that I come up against. And the fact that today now there are people who are third generation poly people mm-hmm. whose grandparents were polyamorous and their parents were, that this is definitely not something that's only limited to young people and it's just a phase and it can't last and isn't, isn't committed. Um, there's a really good book or two really good books by Dr. Elizabeth Sheff that specifically study polyamorous families I would recommend checking those out too. That's called The Polyamorous Next Door and Stories from the Polycule are those two books. The next misconception I wanted to bring up is this one that polyamory is for people who just want to have lots of sex or it's for people who are sex addicts or right that it's just all about having lots of sex. And 
the thing I always like to respond to this is if your goal is to just have a lot of sex with a lot of different people, polyamory is not the way to do that. The <laughs> easiest way to do that is just to be a single person who's dating um, <laughs> and live in a city will probably help too. Right. But, but seriously, polyamory is something that involves actual open and honest communication with people um, before you know, in polyamory, before people have sex, there's often a lot more conscious conversation about the fact that we're going to have sex, about our STI status, about our safe sex practices, about using protection, about all of that, as well about as our who other else, partners. About who else, yeah, exactly, about who yes. else you are sleeping with and what kind of, uh, you know, safe sex practices you're using with them. Right, as opposed to a lot of people who are just casually dating, just kind of, well, let's just not talk about it. Let's just not think about it too much and aren't as proactive because it's not built on this foundation of honesty and communication. Yeah. The other thing is that you can be polyamorous and not have any sex at all. In fact, polyamory is also has a lot of overlap with people in the asexual community. And these are people who don't have sexual desire. They actually just don't want to have sex. They might think people are beautiful. They're still able to have orgasms, but they just don't have that desire for sex the way that other people like myself do. And that polyamory is a place for them too, because it's about having romantic, emotional, committed, real relationships, just not with sexual exclusivity. And so I would say that myth that polyamory is just about having lots of sex would, couldn't be farther from true. I think a lot of the people I know who have more sex than anyone I know are either single people or people in monogamous relationships where the two of them both are just crazy about having <laughs> sex all the time. Finally, uh, the last misconception we wanted to talk about was that everybody who is in a polyamorous relationship is in one giant relationship with each other. <laughs> like, say, when I was in a relationship with Jace, then Jace was also in a relationship with my partner, you know, Josh, and then Dedeker was in a relationship with all of us. And that's not always the case by any means. Often, I think people have this idea that yeah. it's like, oh, if you meet someone new you're interested in, do you have to like introduce them to all your other partners and their partners and they all have to approve that they can join your poly family? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I honestly, I think a lot of people picked that up from, unfortunately, from the polyamory married and dating reality like show that was on HBO. Wives or something. Yes, yeah. because, well, that too. Yeah. because those shows definitely established like, well, we're a triad or we're a th three person relationship. And it's like, if you want to date someone else, you need to get approval from all of us. And that is such a, a like not common practice. Yeah. Polyamory in the polyamorous can be a lot community. of things. Yeah. And I, so I think people think that it's like, you become like the polyamory board of directors or something when you're all in a relationship <laughs> together. Yeah. And most of the time it's just going to be, you know, two people relationships. They're in a relationship with each other. And then I have a relationship with someone else and they have a relationship with someone else and they're not necessarily triads or multi-person relationships, just two yeah. people. That Emily mentioned earlier that there can be these three person or four person or even more relationships, but those are so much more so rare. So rare. Yeah. Right. I think we all understand how difficult it can be to find just one other person that you really connect with and, you know, have this deep connection that you want to keep continuing with them to find that, that not only do you have that with one person, but also with another person who also happens to have that with that other person, that the odds of that are much lower. It is much more difficult to find uh, if you're even looking for it. And a lot of poly people I know aren't even looking for that. They just want to be able to have the relationships that they have with multiple people. They're not trying to put together some big, you know, double king size bed sleeping situation. <laughs> Before we continue with the rest of this, I want to take a quick moment to talk about some ways that you can help support our show and help us to keep doing this. The first and most important of those to us is if you want to become part of our community at Patreon. If you go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, dot com slash multiamory you can choose to pledge a certain amount every month it could be as little as one dollar or up to as much as you want and that just goes directly to us to help us to keep doing this show help to expand it help to get it in front of more people help us to do more live shows when we reach our goal of two thousand a month we're going to be able to do more live shows in the rest of the country which we're really excited about 
We also released recently a new reward tier where if you choose to pledge $7 a month, in addition to getting access to our private Facebook group, you also get ad-free versions of our episodes on your own private RSS feed, as well as getting all of those episodes a day early. So pretty cool. If you want to support us, we would love it so much. And we love getting to build this community of people who really care about this stuff that we're talking about. So thank you so much for your help. And that again is patreon.com slash multiamory. Another thing you can do if you don't want to give any money or if you already are a patron is to leave us a review on iTunes or on Stitcher. Uh, reviews really do help a lot because it helps us show up higher in search results. It helps people to find our podcast and it helps them to know what to expect if they're considering, well, I don't know, I have a limited amount of time in my day. Do I want to spend it on this podcast or on something else? So your reviews really go a long way in getting new listeners to this content, which will hopefully make for lots of better available partners out there for you and all of us. And then lastly, our sponsor for this episode is Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory, you can get a 30-day free trial and one free audiobook. And that free audiobook doesn't matter if it's a super expensive audiobook or something much cheaper. You can get that and uh, and listen to it. And even after your trial's up, you get to keep that audiobook and can still listen to it. It's great. I did my Audible trial a couple years ago and still have my account today. I have a bunch of books in it and I love it. Uh, I just recently finished listening to A Handmaid's Tale. I know we talked about that a few episodes ago as well, um, but I highly recommend it. There's also courses and things on there, like Dedeker did one on cultural intelligence a while back. And uh, I have a course that's on you know, online marketing, all these sorts of things. Really great resource for a pretty low amount every month. And if you sign up for the trial, in addition to getting the free audiobook, they will help support our show, whether you keep your subscription or not. So if you haven't done that yet, please check it out. That's audibletrial.com slash multiamory. And with that, let's get back to the questions. Uh, well, I suppose this leads into the next question, which is, do your partners interact with each other at all? Definitely. They, I Definitely. mean, there's a term called metamors. So that is your partner's partner, right? Your partner's yes. partner. Yeah, your partner's yeah. other yes. partner other than you. Other than you, yeah. <laughs> and so you are a metamor with your partner's partner. Um, and you share a partner, essentially. Um, and I think we definitely encourage people to have responsible, good, open communication in their relationships with their metamors, just because it, you know, that's a good thing to do. It's good to be aware and open and honest with everyone involved and to have someone on your team um, say like, hey, I want to get together with my metamor and plan a big birthday surprise for our partner, which is something that Jace did uh, with one of Dedeker's partners recently for her birthday, and it was amazing and beautiful. It was the most, was the most romantic thing anyone's ever done for me. Exactly, <laughs> and like, oh. how cool is that? Because partners get to come together and and do that collectively for their their person. Well, I want to piggyback off of that because, like, that was great. That you know, my partner Jason, my partner Alex, you know, coordinated secretly to have this big birthday surprise um, for me. Uh, and they do have a friendship, but it's also, it's not an obligation to be interacting with your metamor all the time or to have a best friend relationship all the time or anything like that. I mean, or to date them or have or sex to date with them, them or, or have sex yeah. with them, anything like that. Like none of that is an obligation. Of course, we encourage people that you're probably going to have a better time if you at least have a little bit of a channel of communication with your metamor. It'll probably be better. It's probably going to be better if you at least sit down and meet them for a cup of coffee and see them face to face at least once. It can help to take kind of the scariness away out of that relationship. But you're not under any kind of obligation obligation to have to be in some kind of relationship with your metamor. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'd say like Dedeker was saying that just having some communication is really important and being, you know, respectful of each other. I think it also helps make them seem less scary. If you have interaction with your metamors, you realize that they're real people just like you are. They're not some, you know, perfect idea that you've conjured up in your head, or maybe some terrible person that you imagine them to be, you know, whatever it is, you realize they're just a human being like you are. And what's really cool is in the same way that if you meet someone else who 
has the same like really specific hobby that you have, <laughs> you're immediately going to go, oh, cool. We probably have some stuff in common. We can talk about that. And if you think about it, you and this other person both have in common the fact that you really like this one other person, mm -hmm. which is a pretty specific thing. So right from the start, you at least have that in common. And often you'll find out you have a lot more too. Mm -hmm. I found that most often I don't develop super close relationships with a lot of my metamors. I have occasionally, but generally speaking, it's just we have sort of a cordial acquaintance friendship type of thing. And that's a great way. And I feel like that's most often how it goes um, in, in good, well-functioning poly relationships. So this is another question that people ask quite often, uh, which is, have you participated in sexual activity with more than one of your partners in the same setting? Uh, Essentially, it's like a technical way of saying, so do you have like threesomes and orgies? Yeah, and so do you have orgies all the time? All the time? Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. And I mean, I can, I can start out by answering for all three of us, which is to say, yes, all three of us have had experiences of having some kind of sexual activity with more than one of our partners in the same setting. Um, whatever kind of configuration you want to imagine, go nuts, sure. Um, <laughs> we kind of wanted to pivot on this question a little bit because the fact that it's like, yes, we've all three of us individually and collectively have had that experience. However, at least I know in my own life, I've also had a lot of relationships where we don't do that, where there isn't any kind of sexual overlap with my partners and that's just fine. Um, kind of giving a callback to talking about that misconception that polyamory is just about people who want to have a lot of sex or a lot of kinky sex. Um, for as many people there are in the polyamorous community that enjoy threesomes or orgies or some kind of kinky sex, there are just as many people who really just want vanilla sex and don't enjoy group sex or don't really want group sex that much. And so the thing is, it's like, yes, group sex happens. You know, the polyamorous community is generally quite sex positive. However, there's also a lot of people who, even though they're sex positive, that doesn't mean that they want everyone in their life to have sex with each other all the time. Um, so both sides of the fence uh, are equally present and equally valid. I, I'd like to take that even a step further. It's just to clarify that being sex positive also doesn't mean that you think sex is amazing and should have it all the time. It's more about wanting to take away the shame and the secrecy that a lot of us feel like we need to have around sex and instead saying sex can be a really healthy and great thing. And if you want to have it, go for it. And if you don't, then don't that it's not like something that you have to be doing. And I would say for Dedeker saying that it's even, I would say actually the vast majority of polyamorous people the vast majority of the time, you're not having threesomes or foursomes or any kind of group sex. You're just having sex with your partners, but not at the same time. That's the vast, vast, vast majority of it. Even people who are really into having group sex, it's still probably not the majority of the sex that they're having. I think that's a really common misconception that it's just orgies and threesomes all the time. And I will say polyamorous people spend a lot of time talking it's a lot of like conversation and potentially conversation about sex and the type of sex that you want to be having in your life collectively or by yourselves or just in your couple um, and i will also say that if you are having sex with another person um it, like in a threesome situation that the nice thing about polyamory is that it's not like okay we're just going to kick this person out and then be together and not think about them anymore Instead, you know, it kind of offers that kindness and acceptance and loving sort of understanding for the potential third in the relationship or the third person in your bedroom at that particular moment. Um, Even just respect. Yeah. Just, just basic human respect for that person. Totally. They're not more like, than just like a sex toy with a pulse. Yeah, exactly. They're not just like someone there to serve a purpose for the two of you. Instead, they are an actual human being. And that, I think, is what distinguishes maybe a polyamorous threesome from one that you would have maybe in monogamy where you're like well we're just going to do this fun thing but get them the hell out of here because they may fuck up a relationship and then immediately do damage control after it. exactly yeah. i can't even tell you how many times i've heard that and it yeah, just makes it's me sad just, it's awful um i just do want to point out though that even like 
I'm trying to imagine, even if I was somebody who like, let, let's say that I have three partners right now. And even if I was somebody who was like, I really want to have sex with all three of those partners at the same time. And even if we supposed all three of those partners are down with that and want to do that, just trying to schedule that. Good oh God. God. It's <laughs> like, impossible. Good We're God. all adults. Impossible. Like, Not even yeah. worth the how sexy it would be potentially yeah (laughs) (laughs) so along that note um this is an interesting question do you feel more or less passionate with certain partners now that's a really interesting question and of course i want to zero in on the word passion to wonder like okay what does passion mean so when i think of the word passion i think of like that rush that you get when when you're first falling in love with somebody and you just like you think about them all the time and you want to be around them and when you're apart from them or when they haven't texted you back you just feel like you're going to die and then when you are with them like you just want to have sex for hours and it's it's yeah it's just that that like all consuming lust and desire that you have for another person and that's so called that's called hormones that, well, that's what I think of. Like, I think of what we call NRE or new relationship energy, which is that, which is that rush of intense emotion and passion that you get when you're first falling in love with somebody. And it is, you know, it's a big chemical cocktail that's firing off in your brain that is left over from years and years of evolution um, that gets us to, you know, actually have sex with a person and stick around to raise a baby, you know. Um, and so, like, it's there for a purpose. And so, of course you know, when I have a partner that I've been with, let's say for 10 years, and then I start dating somebody new and I start falling in love with them, you know, I'm going to have that kind of weird chemical cocktail going on with that new person and maybe not so much with the person I've been with for 10 years. However, that doesn't mean that one of those relationships is better than the other or more loving or more important than the other. It's just different. And I think that, Something that I've appreciated about being polyamorous is that it really has helped me to get an understanding and appreciation of all the different ways that love can feel day to day. Because one day love may feel like that crazy, sick, dizzy stars in your eyes falling in deep crush with somebody. Other days love can feel like coming home to your partner of 10 years and curling up on the couch and watching your favorite show and sharing your favorite cocktail and uh and just feeling so safe and so warm and so comfortable and loving being around that person so much and so many different iterations of that in between. Um, and also, and then that, that can change and fluctuate, you know? Um, so for me, that's where it comes down to is it's like, when I hear that question, do you feel more or less passion with certain partners? It's like, Yes. No, I don't know. Yeah. I I feel passion with my partners and day to day that may change depending on the context, I guess is kind of the easiest, most pat answer that I can give. I'll take this question in a little bit different direction. And instead of thinking about passion in that kind of, you know, rush of chemicals sort of way to instead, a lot of people will ask like, oh, well, do you have you know, one partner who's more important than another one? Mm. Or, do, or do you have to treat all of them equally? And this is something that people can do different ways, but something that the three of us have come across and that we talk about a lot on our show is the idea that just like with your friends or with your family members, there might be some that you connect with on a deeper level or some that you spend more time with or, you know, and that can change over time, of course, but that you're not treating one relationship as more important because you have to, or just because they were first, or just because you said that you were always going to, but instead that you have, you know, your longer relationships, you have a lot more history with both for good and for bad, but you have a connection that no new relationship can compete with. You just have a lot more time than they have. Uh, But on the other hand, you might connect with a new partner about some new thing. So rather than thinking of it as kind of this top down, like it's prescribed that you're going to be the one who always comes first, you're always going to come second, you're going to come third, and you will maybe get my spare time, that instead it's everyone is treated equally with respect but that doesn't mean you're gonna spend the same amount of time or do all the same things with every person because that's absurd. We don't do that with our friends or anyone else in our life. Why would we do that with our romantic partners? I will say there are polyamorous people out there that do operate under a hierarchical 
kind of model. So where somebody is primary or they are the nesting partner or they are married and then you may have a secondary or a tertiary relationship or comet relationships that just come around once in a while in your life, like when you guys are in town together with one another. But we tend to try to steer clear of that. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, just that we like to sort of operate under the relationship anarchy stance of, hey, everyone has a place in your life and nobody is better or worse. They just may be in different places in the your relationship with them. Like, I have known Jace for seven years, and I have known Dedeker for less time than that, but I still care about them deeply in different ways, and we have very different relationships with one another. Jace and I have a huge amount of history behind our relationship, but that doesn't mean that I value my relationship with Dedeker any less, because... I haven't known her as long. And it also doesn't mean that I would expect to be able to come in and dictate the terms of their friendship with each other. I don't think we would imagine we could do that with our friends, or at least I wouldn't want to keep friends who thought they could tell me how much time I can spend with my other friends. And so I like to apply that same sort of thinking to our romantic relationships. And while, as Emily said, some people do operate that way, it is definitely not something that we encourage on our show and have seen it cause a lot of hurt in people's lives when they do try to operate in that way, thinking that it's going to avoid hurt, but actually ends up hurting people a lot more. Have you dealt with jealousy? Who hasn't dealt with jealousy? (laughs) No, I'm perfect. I float above the ground. We know. (laughs) Well, I think that's what a lot of people think about polyamorous people. They think, oh gosh, you must not have jealousy. So I could never do that because I get jealous. They would be wrong. They would be dead wrong. (laughs) And I will say, okay, When Jason and I first became polyamorous, I would get sick to my stomach in jealousy or just at the thought that, like, he was going out with someone else or he was going to be sleeping potentially with someone else. And it would be all of these, like, crazy what if scenarios in my mind. I just have learned to deal with it over the years and really get to a sense of also, hey, my partner is their own person and they. It doesn't mean that they love me any less because they're getting to go out with someone else. It just simply means that they're having an experience and I may get to have an experience as well at a later date. And then we can come back together and uh, have a loving experience with each other. And that's really amazing and beautiful. When you it's, say it has learned to deal with it, it sounds pretty I, negative. Well, well so, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, but but come on, like, I, I think I'm way better than I ever have been. But there are times when I'm like, you know what, just like suck it up. Just like chill the fuck out. It's going to be okay. Yourself? Yes. Yeah. To myself about jealousy. So it's always so difficult with the jealousy question because it's never just do you get jealous or do you not get jealous? There's so many more questions to delve into the context behind it. It's you know, how is the communication with you and your partner in this particular instance? Is there a history in this relationship of your partner lying to you? Or do you feel really solid about your communication with your partner? What kind of insecurities do you have? And how do you manage those insecurities? Um, Like there's so, so many factors that go into what might be a jealous response, what might cause a jealous response, or how you might choose to react to it and handle it that can be so very different. Um, I feel for myself these days that of course like I still experience jealousy but after doing this for 10 years <laughs> um you know I think I've learned I've learned like what are my insecurities what are my hang-ups what are the things that I just need to heal within myself or maybe talk to my partner about you know my own insecurities or my own vulnerabilities and most of the time for me it's it's really you know I've come to this place of knowing like oh sure like maybe I feel jealous but that doesn't mean anything Like, it doesn't mean anything. Like, maybe I'll feel a little twinge of jealousy, but I know my partner is not going to leave me. I know that, you know, like partner A and partner B, maybe they've both demonstrated to me, like really being really trustworthy and committed to me. And like, I know they're not going to leave me. I know that I've gotten through this situation before. And nine times out of 10, it's not the end of the world when I feel jealous. So that's where I end up these days, but that's also after a lot of time and a lot of experience and a lot of research. If you're someone who's at the beginning and you're first having to be faced with this idea of 
experiencing jealousy, but then just kind of having to push through it or get through it somehow, that can be really daunting when we've been told our entire lives that romantic jealousy is completely unacceptable and that it's our partner's responsibility to make sure that we never feel jealous. So I think that that is another big factor is that kind of accepting like, yes, we feel jealous in many arenas in our lives, not just our romantic relationships. We can feel jealous of coworkers. We can feel jealous of classmates. We can feel jealous of our siblings. Um, we learn to manage those. And it's kind of taking those same skills that we used to manage those and bringing those to, that to your romantic relationships. Yeah, a big turning point for me, well, there are two big turning points for me with jealousy. The first one was in understanding that being jealous doesn't mean that you love someone. Like that the more you Mm. love someone doesn't mean you're going to be more jealous. If you think about being in love with someone, means that, that their happiness is something that you value, right? If you love someone, you want them to be happy. And by being jealous, you're saying, I don't want you to have these other experiences that might make you happy, that that's not the same thing as love. In fact, sometimes it can be the opposite of being loving to a partner is to be really jealous of them. So that was the first turning point for me was hitting that realization. And then the second one was in uh, touching on what Dedeker was just saying, that we deal with jealousy all the time in other areas of our lives with our friends or coworkers or family, and that a healthy, well-adjusted adult would be expected to deal with that in a way that's not destructive and doesn't involve throwing temper tantrums and doesn't involve cutting off those friends or family members. But for some reason, when it becomes to romantic or sexual jealousy, we think, oh, this is something you can't possibly manage, even though we manage jealousy all the time in other areas of our life. And when I tell this to people, some go, wow, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And others will say, oh, but it's different. And then they'll try to come up with some sort of evolutionary psychology explanation for why like, sexual jealousy is more important than others. But the actual truth of it is that while there are some scientists who've tried to make those arguments as well, they're coming to it trying to argue something that they've already assumed is true because their culture has taught them that it is. And that so often these arguments or these ideas aren't very well thought out because it's like, oh, well, everyone understands that, or I just know it in my heart to be true. It just makes us, you know, reach these illogical conclusions or conclusions without a lot to back them up. Uh, And that there is a lot of research showing that that's not actually true, um, that the jealousy isn't hardwired into us in the way that some people will say that it is. I'll just say finally that a better way of putting what I had said before is just that I have allowed myself, I've figured out ways and tools in which jealousy does not derail my life where it may have had or done so in the past. And that, like you said, it it generally comes from looking within. So you have to like view exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve with that jealousy. And, And it may just be an emotional response. And if you can separate like, your emotion from what is really happening then that's a great thing to do as well and know that like if you keep feeding it then that is obviously not going to be a productive thing to do but if you can step outside of it and try to just feed your soul and your happiness in a different way then hopefully you can get past that moment of intense jealousy if you can imagine just like you know, if a friend has some really amazing experience that you wish you could have had, yeah, it feels shitty. But, you know, you're kind of like, ah, you know, honestly, I'm really jealous of you. It doesn't mean I don't want you to have had that experience, but I really wish I could have had that. If you can approach that in your romantic relationships, I think that takes a lot of the pressure off. So finally, we are going to list one reason why we should consider being polyamorous or why someone should consider being polyamorous. I would say the number one reason to consider it is just the fact that there are other ways to do relationships. I think for so many of us, we've done relationships the way we've done them because we think that's the only option and that there aren't any choices. And I think the most important thing I would like people to take away is to realize that just because everyone's been doing something one way doesn't mean it's the only way, it doesn't mean it's the best way, it doesn't mean it's the healthiest way. It might be for you, but that's not necessarily the case. And to just actually give it some thought and maybe try some other things to find out what's right for you. 
I'm going to go real practical here, but if you're a person who has cheated or just always cheats, maybe consider being polyamorous just simply because it will allow you to have a different relationship structure than just monogamy. And instead of being unethical about it, make it be an ethical part of your life. And I, I think people who just routinely cheat, they can flourish under this. And if they can really figure out how to be ethical and good in their relationships and learn then how to find be honest happiness. about it. That's, yeah, so that's the thing honest. is if yeah, someone who routinely cheats can learn to be honest about how they're feeling, then yeah, polyamory would probably be a good fit. Absolutely. But if the cheating comes from being secretive and dishonest, then that polyamory is not going to fix that's that. Shitty. It's going to make it just as bad. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, something that I really disliked about monogamy was this idea of like going on dates. And when you go on dates, it's not, I get to enjoy a fun date getting to know somebody. It's I'm putting somebody through a job interview of, are you going to, can I, based on two hours that we're going to spend together, (laughs) can I judge if you're going to be the right person to provide all of my needs to that you will be the person who I'll be sexually attracted to for the rest of my life, that you will be a good father to my children, that you will be a good provider, that you will be my, my, my personal trainer, that you will be my therapist, that you will be my parent, you know, like all of these things that all of these expectations that we put on a monogamous partner when we're expecting that we're going to find the one person who's going to solve all of our problems. Um, And for me, I just loved being able to step out of that and being able to accept the love I got from a partner just as it is without worrying, like, is this person going to be a good parent? Um, You know, or is this person still going to be here 20 years from now? It's like, we don't know. And life changes and people change so much. And so I think that if you're interested in having a relationship model that may possibly help, like be you know, help you to better adjust to people changing and life being uncertain. That's what I would say would be, you know, this would be a good fit for you. Um, so my goodness, we yapped a lot, but thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Um, polyamory and non-monogamous relationships are so often misunderstood. And so I hope that in listening, we were able to answer some of your questions and give you some things to think about. If you'd like to have your question or comment played on our show, you can call 678-MULTI-05 and leave us a voicemail. Or you can send us an audio message at the Multiamory Facebook page if you don't want to call internationally to the U.S. You can also email us at info at multiamory.com or send us a message on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. To support our show and to join our private Facebook community or to get ad-free episodes a day early, go to patreon.com slash multiamory. Multiamory is created and produced by Emily Matlack, Dedeker Winston, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. Hi, I'm Marla Marie Dean, author of Behind Closed Doors, and you're listening to a Swing Set podcast on swingset.fm. <laughs>